let's just skip to some code. I haven't done that with people. Is that okay? It's fine. We're all pretty close. Yeah, it's all right. All right, cool. All right. Uh, you good? You recording? We are 21 seconds in. Sweet. I'll have to cut all that bullshit out. All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, the, the, the purpose of this talk is, is uh, for me to just talk about a, an experience that I went through and all the things that I liked and didn't like about PureScript. The, uh, the big problem about it is that I was working on a proof of concept feature for our text editor, so I can't really talk about details. But I hope that I've given enough examples along the way. Pick me up if I haven't. So I guess, so a little bit of background on this task. Uh, three months ago, I joined EFOX as a senior Scala backend and DevOps engineer. Uh, we're in a cool place. Um, we do, we, we uh, do content creation. So our two biggest products are two WYSIWYG HTML editors. One TinyMC, which you've probably heard of. It's in WordPress and lots of other things. Uh, and textbox.io, which sits in the IBM space of uh, Web Content Manager and Connections. Uh, both really cool, um, and both heavily involved with doing really crazy stuff and content editable. Stuff that I'm not really uh, familiar with or have any skills in. But a few weeks in, uh, we, we kind of needed a volunteer to make a, a marketing prototype for a new feature. Uh, and. Uh, so we we're going to start with an existing editor, which was already in JavaScript. It was open source and MIT license. And just kind of weasel it in the editor and the UI and uh, just figure out how it played with the content and get all the events of being in the editor all lined up and happy. And then the, the idea was to slowly rewrite this library until we, we could build up all the features that we wanted. Uh, obviously, the library itself didn't do everything. Uh, if we could just bring the open source library in, then it wouldn't be much of a feature. Uh, but the idea was to just see whether the idea worked and then build it up and build it up. Um, so I can't talk about the actual feature, uh, but the, the general shape of it is that when, when we loaded the content, uh, um, we, were, we needed to load some kind of meta content from a separate API. And then we needed to attach this meta content to all the, the content in the editor. So we had to find where it was supposed to go and join it all up or load. Then we're doing a whole heap of horrible interactions with content clicks and hovers and selections and clicks on the toolbars and all that kind of nonsense. Uh, and then some kind of modal for interacting with the meta content. Then persisting all that back to the back end and dot, dot, dot. There was, a, there was a fair bit of stuff in there. And for someone who's mainly a web programmer and an, a DevOps guy, this stuff's a bit tricky. Especially an FP guy, don't deal with this stuff very well. Um, so the, the library itself was kind of glued together with this horrible, extremely tight callback plugin manager where it just kind of said, I care about these things, please send them to me at some point. It was impossible to follow. Um, it was just, it took, me, it took me a long time just to figure out what the hell it was doing. I mean, sure it's modular, but you can't reason about the whole thing at any point in time, which bugs the hell out of me. Um, can get it all working. Obviously, it's a working open source library, but it was really fragile. And as I started building on it, it just it was, my skills as a JavaScript program were quickly at their tether. Um, and it just it kept getting worse as I was adding more and more components. Uh, a lot of it is because I'm not used to dealing with these things. I don't code the right way to, to kind of deal with JavaScript. But really. JavaScript was just too hard for my brain, uh, and I just kept making mistakes and mutable objects and forgetting where effects are happening, and I just I got to the point where I couldn't deal with it anymore. Um, so I, I I thought about PureScript. This was a proof of concept. Uh, I can do whatever the hell I want, right? It's not meant to go to production. This is my uh, this is my card to make sure that my crappy prototype never goes to production. Uh, so I gave it a go. Um, and the whole, the whole idea of being bringing PureScript in here was to try and help my brain deal with these things and reason about them with types. So I could think about the important things of the feature that I was actually trying to do. And anybody who's played Elite Beat Agents should hopefully get that. If not, you should play that game. It's the best rhythm game, I think. Anyhow, so this talk is, is kind of the journey. Uh, the things that worked well and the things that don't, didn't work so well. Um, 
Yeah, it won't teach you anything about PureScript, I don't think. Don't expect to come away from this thinking, I know PureScript, I'm going to do it, because uh, it's certainly not that easy. Uh, but hopefully it either encourages you to dive in and learn it, maybe you've got a problem, like a proof of concept thing that you could do, do something like I did with it, or at least pester me for more talks, because uh, more talks are always good. Getting ideas there is always cool. So, I guess, the elevator pitch. Why would I use PureScript? It's a static, statically typed functional language, so it's got all the goodies. It's got immutability, it's got sum types, it's got tracked effects, all the, all the kind of things that my brain is used to having to be able to reason about and construct programs that work. I found that I really don't do very well without these anymore, which is awesome, but except when I'm forced to code JavaScript. I don't know how the guys at work actually do it. They do wonderful things with it. It's magical. It seems to work. Uh, but PureScript is very Haskell-y, so it, it, it aligns with what my brain's used to even more. And it's got a whole lot of principled APIs that kind of lean on the maths that mathematicians have been thinking about for quite some time. And they have laws, and the, these laws mean that the abstractions, you can build on them and actually reason about your code working on the other side, which is really cool. And it even fixes some historical mistakes that we're kind of stuck with in the Haskell-based library. So even if you weren't planning on ever using PureScript, it's a nice thing to look at to say, maybe Haskell could be like this one day. It's a cool thing to look at for that, for that reason alone. But it's also very JavaScript-y. Uh, and this is actually a really cool point as we go through. The, 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 the kind of mismatch between what you're doing in the language and the, how it's run is very, very close to JavaScript. So you don't find yourself having to leap over a giant wall to go either to JavaScript or back to PureScript or back again. Uh, and having that low wall is really cool, especially if you were doing something what I was doing where you were kind of rewriting the library bit by bit. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, and even the, the generated JS is, is pretty readable and uh, sane to debug if you need to. Uh, Sometimes you do, but that, they're normally mistakes that you've made, you've made yourself. Um, yeah, and as I said, jumping out and calling JS is really, really simple. And it doesn't have a runtime, which I guess the, the bad thing is that the language is strict, so if you used Haskell, that could be a problem. Trip me up a fair bit. Uh, but it means that it's simple. You're not, there is not a big mismatch. You don't have to worry about a big runtime getting in the road or doing anything weird. It's pretty much JavaScript. Cool. So let's let's dig into the things that I found cool. Uh, and any, I, I'm purposely not explaining syntax here. So if there's anything weird uh, that is kind of, I'm assuming people know a bit of Haskell, just pick me up, put your hand up, uh, and we'll sort it out. Cool. All right. So the first thing that we need to start off with are records. Uh, so records, you can. Every I oh, can yeah. see that. Uh, cool. Uh, the thing about records is you, it's really it's a, it's think of them as like JS objects themselves. So we're we're explicitly saying see. Here. cool. We're explicitly saying that this this record has two things in it. It's got a stuff which is a string, and it's got things which is an array of strings. Not very inventive. Um, but then we can we can construct a stuff uh, with this syntax here, which is just curly braces much like you would in JavaScript. Again, it's supposed to be pretty close to what you're used to. And we're saying stuff is a string and things is an array of things. Uh, pretty close, pretty normal. Um, and even, even underneath the hood, everything here is represented as a vanilla JavaScript object and an array. There's no magic here, there's no nothing. If you took this thing and shoved it into a JavaScript function, it would do exactly what you think it would. Um, and to access, to access these things, well, access our things in our stuff, we just use the dot operator. Uh, which is annoying, because it means you can't use dot for compose, but that's a different story. I think people know dot, so fine. Um, compose is actually triple less than. So it's, it's, syntactically it's awful compared to what you used to in Haskell, but it does exactly the same thing. Um, cool. But the cool thing about records is that they're, they're not only static. Like you can, you can talk about records that you care about that it has things, 
but it also has other things in it that you do not care about. Uh, and this is what the same text here is. I should point to both of these, I'm sorry. Uh, so what this is saying is that I care about this type having a things, which is an array of strings, but for the, everything else in the record, it can have whatever. I don't really care, it can be completely open. Um, so we can see this in use down here. So if we go, if we make a, a function called want things, which says for anything, for any possible record that at least has things, uh, let's return the array of string. So this will work for um, the stuff that we defined before, and it'll define it'll work for this type here, which is essentially the same thing but with other stuff in there. Uh, it will just work. And so what we can do is we can treat all these different records as the same thing because all we're caring about is this little thing successor, which is pretty cool. Uh, yep, 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 yep. Cool. And calling them is easy. You don't have to do anything fancy with types. It just works it all out. Cool. And updates work much in the same way. I can take any has things and a new array of strings and set them into the record, completely leaving everything else that was in there alone. Uh, so I can update my stuff with an empty array, I can update my extended stuff with an empty array, and everything that I'm not updating just stays the same. And what's even better is that these things are immutable, so you don't have to worry like you do in JavaScript, which I cause so many bugs for myself, changing objects that other things are relying on and then blowing up somewhere. Uh, so you just don't have to think about these. These are vanilla JS objects, but the stuff underneath will worry about copying stuff for you and making it all immutable, which is cool. But nested, as soon as you start nesting these structures, it gets pretty gnarly. Um, I mean, it, it, this is with two levels and it's already looking pretty ugly. You can, you can imagine what this extrapolates out to. Um, so more, eventually you want lenses. I'm not going to talk about lenses um, this evening because that's a talk in itself. Um, you should look them up if you don't know what they are, uh, or ask us to do a talk because that would be cool too. Um, and eventually you want lenses because they give you a, a pattern of having the getter and setter in the same thing that you can compose together and you can kind of compose all these lenses together and just set this thing in here or get this thing in here and it does all the copying and everything for you. Um, but once you do that, you lose the duct typing. Like you lose the ability to say, I just care about a, th a record that has things, but it can have other stuff, which is really annoying. Um, and PureScript doesn't have classy lenses, uh, and it doesn't even have constraint kinds, so there's no possible way that you could make it nicer in PureScript right now. Um, so it can't be as nice as Haskell, but there's hope. There, I remember seeing there's an issue for creating constraint kinds in PureScript, so it's not off the cards, they just haven't done it yet. And I guess once they have that, classy lenses can be a thing. Uh, except they like doing everything to generics, and it might be hard, but whatever. Um, cool. Cool, cool. So that's enough about records. A really cool thing that I need in pretty much every programming language that I use now is are some types. So it's just it's the ability to have a type that has multiple choices in it. That's pretty boring. You could just have an, you could just have an abstract class and inherit from them. But uh, cool. Um, so that's pretty boring in itself, but it's really useful for modeling errors and like input events. And stuff where you have a whole bunch of choices, but you'd like to encode all those choices in a closed way in your program. So the difference there is that I, I want to say, I want to actually model every possible error that can happen in my program and have that set to be closed. So I don't have to wonder, can I have this error or can I have this error? I just want to know the exact set. And the reason why that's really cool is because when we're using some types, the, the, the flip side to that is having pattern matching. So um, with pattern matching, we, we pattern match each of these constructors out, uh, and we are forced to do a thing based on each of the constructors. And the really cool thing about pattern matching is that, oh, hey Rob. Hey Ben. Um, the really cool thing about pattern matching is that if I write a import handler that only handles one of those cases, I get this big ugly error message. And it's really cool that they're going to force 
people to put a partial constraint on functions later when if they're not. Like the, the partiality will actually be part of the, the type of the function later on. So you'll be able to say, I don't care about those, but I may blow up. That's cool. Uh, maybe some people won't want that at all, but it's nice to have it in the type, type system. Um, so just, just being able to make this, this input handler and get told that I've missed a case because somebody's added a new event over here that I'm not handling, really awesome. Um, and like the th same thing happens with errors, like I'd like to handle every possible error that has and provide a good message or do things there as well. Cool. That's enough about some types. I mean, and the, the, the rest of the story is really good too, so there's, there's all the immutable structures that you kind of know and love. So you've got arrays, you've got lists and maps. Uh, and as I said before, some of these are just very close to JS objects, like string map is literally just an object. An array is an array, but PureScript is taking care of copying it when you change it for you, which is lovely. It can be slow, but there are different structures that you can trade off if you're updating things or accessing things in certain ways. Cool. But be very careful when you give these, these very raw objects to uh, FFI functions, because they can do whatever the hell they want with it, and if they mutate it, they can do weird and bad things to you. Uh, if you were writing proper code, it would probably be ideal that you copy all of these things when you hand it out to FFI, so if they change it, it's not going to affect your code. But there's nothing in the FFI that does that for you. Cool. All right. Are there any questions at this point? Because I'm about to kind of shift to a different topic. So is that all making sense? Am I speaking too fast? Oh, I have a question at this point. Yes. I could save it to the end, but it's related to this first half. Yes. So you said it, it doesn't have, QScript doesn't have classy lenses? It does not. I think it has type classes, right? It does have type classes. I think it has lenses. What's it missing that doesn't let it do that? Constraint kinds. Okay. Because constraint kinds allows you to wrap up all those... Oh, that lets you say functor f on the right-hand side. Uh, yeah, it allows you to put, it allows you to make a type alias of types class constraints. So you can kind of build them up level by level and not have to write out 20 type class constraints all in one thing. Yeah, okay. Because not being able to write a type alias like you can with records really sucks. Because if you go back to the records... Uh, if you go back to the records here, right. like you can make a type alias for that and reference it by the name, mm -hmm. but you cannot do that with type class constraints. And that's what constraint kinds gives you. Okay. And I think if you can't give them names that you can abstract over, it just gets very gnarly very quickly. So like you could theoretically do classy lenses, but then all your functions will have 200 line types. So yes. I needed this and I needed that. Your coworkers would hate you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if that's the case, you might be better off using records if you have a reasonably flat structure. All right. If you don't, then you have a hard choice. Get the pure script people to write constraint kinds. All right. Or write it yourself. It's open source. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, really, it's it's the we have type classes, but constraint kinds is the limiting factor in my head. Cool. All right. Uh, so we've got the flip side to that. the 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 magic behind extensible records are row types, but we won't really go into that. Other than you'll see the same pattern here. Um, so when we when we talk about effects in PureScript, we're talking about tracking them in the F monad. Is that Oh, slides with code are pretty small. They require some zooming, but it's all right. All right, cool. Uh, so what we're saying here is that if if we hello world, which is just console.logging, it's the first thing that you do when you write a JavaScript program. Uh, it's just going to log to a console, and when when we when we have any kind of effect, we track each individual like category of effect with these little tags in here, uh, and this this guy here is just saying that. This effect is open, so you can join me with effects that also have other things, which we'll see in a tick. Uh, and that's, that's exactly the same pattern as what we're doing with the extensible records. So it's nice that that concept goes across. Uh, yep, talked about that. I should not talk ahead about myself and look at my notes. Cool. Um, so let's look at combining these events. So let's just say we, we, write, we need to write a function that attaches a button event to a button. Uh, so we're, we're going to find the element by its ID. That might be there or may not be there. 
So if it's not there, we just want to go log. I couldn't find the button, I'm sorry. Not production code, but it gives you the idea. And then if the button is there, we want to add our event listener. So it's a click. We want to log that the button was clicked and a few other things that are kind of just noise. Um, now when we look at our effect here, we now have console and DOM. So we didn't have to do anything here to kind of say merge these together or any sort of type class, like type casting or anything. They just, they gel together because they're both extensible, taking it as something that has console and open and DOM and open merges together really nicely. Cool. Are there any questions there? That's normally the point where we lose people. So if, if, you're, if you're weirded out by that. Um, yes. I, I've got a question there. They've got the, that's a cool extensible effects thing. I'm wondering if you like Monad transformers, is there an MTL equivalent in PureScript? Uh, there, are for, there are for the things that need Monad transformers. I haven't talked about that in this talk, but for things like state and writer and reader, you need Monad transformers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so MTL does exist. Uh, you just you don't use it as heavily. Um, but more think of F like IO that just has different slices through it. Okay. It's not really replacing all of Monad transformers. It's more saying I don't want to just have IO. I want to have the console.log part of IO and the DOM part of IO and be able to reason that hey, this thing is having an effect, but it's only, only console.logging, so I probably don't need to care about it too much. Yeah, cool, thanks. Uh, so I guess if you're familiar with Haskell or anything like that, if you see F, it just means IO with an extensible type effect inside of it. Cool, because with extensible effects, you cannot model state, uh, at least the way pure script does it. The paper itself, you could do it. But There's, you lose other things. You lose other things, yeah. And they don't, if they, yeah. M moving on. Uh, so let's move on to the flip side of that. Like, we obviously have structured sequential effects like we do with IO, but with Java Scotland, there's always asynchronous stuff. Um, so that's where we bring in the uh, very, uh, not very imaginatively named AF monad for a asynchronous effects. Uh, so when we're talking AF here, we're talking about. Uh, the same kind of thing, it's a, it, the effects are extensible, so if we need to do console logging or whatever in there, we could. Uh, and this just, it feels like a normal, it is just a monad, so we can use our do notation, uh, treat it much like a promise, uh, if JavaScript could have do notation, which it looks like it's going to soon, but that's fine. Um, we can lift it, single effects into this computation as well, so we can log the fact that we got uh, a 200 from the uh, web server when we call it uh, and then we can obviously return values as well um, so the, the wonderful thing about this is that it feels and looks exactly like F but we actually have it in the type system that it's slightly different and then we should be treating it differently um, and it's got all the same sugar it's pretty awesome uh, so actually running this thing is much like you would run a promise in JavaScript uh, we take our AF here, uh, and then we have an on error callback and an on success callback, and we just write it as per usual. We can log the fact that we got an error, or we can do some funky stuff and parse out the weather and do some stuff with it. Don't worry about the details too much there. There's a bit more details because I have all this as working code in the repository with the slides. So if you want to go and play with this later, any parts of code in here, yeah, any of the code, uh, you'll be able to jump in and just fiddle around with it there. Cool. Uh, that was a lot of details in that slide. Does anybody have any questions about what's going on there? Doesn't it looks pretty boring? And we can go on. Cool. All right. Uh, Actually, wait. I did have a question. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> like, what if we want to get like two different servers instead of just the Brisbane one? Say, want to call like some other service elsewhere. <coughs> Yeah, yep. Yeah, how do we do it? Uh, that's no pr so we go back to this guy here, we'd make this a bit less boring and not just calling Brisbane. Yeah. Uh, and you can make you can easily make multiple ones of these. Yeah. And then you can even you can put the, you can put two apps in the same do comprehension. So you can say do this one, do this one, and then return the results of both of them. And it, 
what if you what if you just want just even just one result? So you're putting like two or three there just to make sure you get at least one result out of it. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. There are some combinators in AF. So I, I I kind of glossed over some details with AF, but every AF obviously has an error condition, but it also has the idea of being cancelable. So there are some combinators in there to say, give me the first one that wins, for instance. So that kind of stuff is in there. Oh, okay. It's a really cool library. Uh, I wanted to gloss over those details because I'm yeah. spouting on and off. But yeah, those things are possible. And that's, that's really cool. And that's the nice thing about having AF and F completely separate so that they can be treated differently and do all those kind of cool things. So if, if you have multiple, uh, it will run them at the same time, or one will wait for another? Uh, if you're doing them in, if you're doing them monadically, so in a do notation, they will happen in sequence. But the combinators that you that say do three of them take a list of them, so they'll do them in parallel. But yeah, if you if you just had if you had these and you call three of them in a row, they do one and then the other one when it returns, and then the other one when it returns. Cool. If you use duplicative over F. It probably does them in parallel, but I don't know for sure. It could. It probably should. Uh, cool. We talked about running them. Cool. Uh, so to summarize, the extensible effects just allow us to to not only have tracked effects in pure script, but allow us to say, hey, this thing's console, this thing's DOM, this thing's AJAX, and be able to take take little functions that do little effects and compose them into bigger effects. Um, and then just giving that, us that nice syntax to deal with this and do nice things. Uh, and then just the, the whole idea of keeping all these in the types and in your face uh, is really cool for being able to reason about them. Cool. At that point, we're good. I'm about to move on. Sweet. All right. So all the all the all the code that you write for FFI and the generated code in PureScript are all common JS modules. It didn't used to be this way. It used to be just strings that you put in your PureScript, and that really sucked. So th this is kind of the new FFI system. Sean, do you know when that came around? The new FFI. Yeah, like a year and a half ago, maybe. Yeah, it was about a year ago. Yeah. I think I wrote some code at iSeq that used the old FFI, and now people yeah, are bugging me to, to update it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this, this, this treats things a lot better, because everything's a CommonJS module, so you can use all the infrastructure that's built around CommonJS stuff, which we'll get into. Um, well, let's just talk about the, the, the FFI to start off with. Uh, bringing in a function from JavaScript plan is actually really easy. You just go foreign, import, the name of the function, and then the type of it. It doesn't necessarily have to have an effect. And this is kind of the, 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 the place where you're saying, I'm promising that this is doing what it's doing. Uh, if it doesn't, you're going to have bad things happen. And I had this happen to me in my proof of concept. I made a very bad assumption about one of the types. And it was very hard to debug. Be careful with that if you're ever going to. It's, it's convenient to just do this. But if you get it wrong, it's very difficult to debug. Just as hard as it is to debug with JavaScript, but you have types there, so you think it's all right. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to figure out where it went wrong. Uh, except that you can just go to the FFI and kind of trace it back to there, but <clears throat> it's not obvious when it breaks, especially with a large code base. Uh, and then we can use these functions just as per normal. Once they're foreign imported, we can just call them. No problems, no nothing. We can write something that formats a date through our imported JS date string function. And we can even write an effect that grabs the current date and puts it through that formatter. Cool. Uh, now on the JavaScript side, uh, it looks like a normal JavaScript thing. This comment here is meant. Oh, this doesn't work. Got a point. Uh, the comment there is mandatory. It uses that very stringly type thing to link it up to the PureScript module that it needs to link up to because it does checking that all the functions that you've foreign imported are actually defined in this module. Um, so, because it's a common JS module, you can just require a moment JS, just as per normal, and bring it in. Uh, and then every every foreign import, you just need to define as a as a module export, which is just really nice. If you're used to JavaScript, this is bread and butter. This is not weird. It just works. 
and you probably already have tooling to make all this stuff really nice. Cool. Uh, and looking at the, ge the generator pure script of the, it was this guy back here. I probably should have put the pure script on there, but oh well. Um, so this guy there generates into this. So you can see some common JS requires from things around the place, bring in prelude, all that kind of jazz. Uh, the cool thing that is, I guess, uh, a tangent to all this is this thing here, which was a do notation, has just expanded out to normal sequential JavaScript stuff. So there's no stack unsafeness or anything there. Uh, so any any do do no, do chain that just has effects in there will just kind of magic its way out into raw JavaScript, which is cool if you've got really long chains of things and you worry about stack or anything like that. Uh, and yeah, that all exports. It looks pretty much like our FFI, except there's some weirder stuff there because we're doing pure scripty things. Uh, but anybody could probably look at that JavaScript and if there was a bug in there, they could figure out what it was. Um, cool. Cool. Um, and the really cool thing about all that is that uh, pure script has kind of adopted Webpack as their de facto tool for gluing all this together. So, I mean, when, once, once you have Webpack there, you can do things like uglification, you can do things like bringing in your SAS compiler and packaging that up in your JavaScript and generating web pages for your single page app that include everything and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it just ties into everything really well. But not only that, it also means that you can... Uh, the, the, the thing that is really good is that you can just bring in JavaScript dependencies, so you, you don't have to worry about Mo like bringing in a fully minified version of Moment.js or anything like that. You can bring in your copy from MVM and just have it be part of the build process, which is nice because uh, the old way of doing FFI was really hard to just say bring in Moment.js and have it package up nicely. It was just, it was not fun not a fun thing. So it's very good that it's been fixed. Um, cool, and the, 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 the final cool thing is that once you have web, in Webpack land, you can start using Webpack's chunking. So I, theoretically, you should be able to use the chunks to bring in the core part of your library and then lazy load bits that are ancillary to, your, to getting the page up and working for your user. Uh, which is really cool because if you think about if it was just this fat wad of pure script generated stuff, that might be much harder to do. Um, I haven't tested that the lazy loading works, but theoretically it should. Um, the pure script loader, though, I have to admit that it is a bit flaky. It's getting better. Uh, there was a point in time where I had to import every pure script file from the project in the index.js just to have it recompile in the development server. Uh, but it seems to be getting a lot better over time. Um, and I think here, you, the, the thing with PureScript is you have to appreciate that it's a pretty bleeding edge tool. So you have to expect some things not to work. You get a cool toy, but there's a price. Um, I, I'm much more sane after dealing with PureScript weirdness than I was trying to get JavaScript to work, that's for sure. So let's talk about the first wave of my prototype. How am I doing for time? 6.35, that's not too bad. I was concerned. Um, so, cool. Uh, so the basic, the, my basic transformation for the start of the prototype was just kind of, let's rewrite things bit and bit, bit by bit. Uh, and the kind of how the F5 and everything worked made this really easy. Um, but the shape of everything didn't change. I still had this really ugly mess. Don't worry about the details too much here, but You've just got these random effectful things that I'm calling out to check whether the editor's dirty and this random callback, this random thing here that's going to get called back when I hit the button in the toolbar. And it just, it, the way that th this kind of callback structure works is while you have types there, you just have this massive web of effects. And it, the types actually make this more annoying because it brings it into your face that everything is effectful. And you haven't really won anything. You just have types there to catch you. Uh, but sometimes the type errors aren't very helpful. Uh, and 
especially bringing in new computations to the leaves of your application, bubble those new effects up and it's quite painful. Uh, and you kind of want to avoid that. Uh-huh. Cool. Uh, cool. Yep. Talking ahead of myself again. Cool. Uh, so, that, I mean, all that kind of stuff worked. It was just, it felt like it wasn't really a win. I had types there, but it felt like I could do a lot better now that I have the types there and immutability and functional programming. Uh, and I'm sure I could have done this in JavaScript too, but I'm too dumb to make JavaScript work. So if you want to pull me up on that, yes, I could make the JavaScript work too. Uh, cool. So the, the basic structure to where I went after that was breaking that, that web of effects with FRP. Uh, now I'm about to talk what FRP is, which is great. Uh, so the, the particular flavor of FRP that I used was signals. Um, so, when you think about signals, it's, it's a, it's a push-based stream of values that will either fire one or multiple times. The simplest signal being the constant hello, which is a signal that only ever fires once. So if you, if you attach something onto the end of that, you would only ever get one instance of hello flowing through, and then it would never give you another value. Um, and from these signals, we can map onto them. So we can... I think that was just electricity. Cool. Uh, from there, we can say, I want to take my hello signal, which is, again, it's just that thing that only prints out once, uh, pushes things down once, and I want to map world onto that, to that string. And then at the end of the hello world effect, like at the end of any signal, you are likely to want to do some kind of effect to the world. So you've got some kind of stream of events or values, and at the end you're going to want to do something, like show it on the web page or push it off to a server or something like that. So we're we going to be boring here. We're using our console.log all over again. Uh, and from there we, we, we end up getting a signal that has an effect, um, which is just that console.log which from there we can use the run signal combinator to just kind of unwrap that to a, an effect that will, like a callback effect that will fire into that context every time a value is pushed through the, pushed through the stream. Uh, so I guess if, if it hasn't quite gelled yet, another way that I like to think about signals is it's kind of like a promise, but it'll fire multiple times. So you've got, some, you've got some, some kind of promise that a value is going to come down, and one, at least one will, uh, but it could fire multiple times, so you need to deal with it multiple times and assign a callback for each one of those. Uh, cool. Sweet. Um, the flip sides to the channels are the, the things that actually produce those values. So a signal by itself, unless we were just streaming constants of hello, we, that would be pretty boring. We need it. We need the end of that signal to produce the value based on something from the outside world. Uh, and we do this by creating a channel, and the channel always has to start off with a value. So often this will start off as nothing because you need to represent that initial state of not having an event uh, with the maybe type. And that's, what's, that's what we're getting here. So we have a signal of maybe of unit. So we will get just unit every time the button is clicked that we're, we're setting up here. Uh, so we are setting up our button on click event handler and just sending just unit to that channel every time. Uh, now a channel by itself needs to be turned into a subscription. So to turn that into a subscription, we subscribe to that channel and return our signal of maybe unit. Um, Anything that writes to a channel has this channel effect baked into its effect, uh, which is cool because you can go through your program and look for those things to, to figure out where these event streams are starting. And even better, because this channel is never escaping this function, we know that nothing other than this event handler here can actually push an event onto the stream. So because we, we, we have that signal and it's now a thing that nothing else can touch, or fiddle with, which is really nice. We just have to go back to the source if something's gone wrong. Cool. 
Um, but obviously, we go, if we're going to have signals, we're going to need to merge them in some way. Uh, because obviously we're going to have more than one button in our UI or something like that. And this is, this is where some types become really, really kick-ass. Because we can, we can model our signal over a sum type, which is all the different events that could flow through this pipe. Uh, we can set up a whole heap of button signals for one, two, and three. And then for each one of those signals, we can, either map, we can map either constructor to it. Which means that we have our usual niceness of our sum type here, that if I forgot to handle one of these button clicks in here, then it would come up as a compiler warning and I'd get warned about it. In an example like this, it looks, looks pretty boring and uh, uh, not very interesting, but when, when you have lots of components that each take an input signal and output either a signal of their own or some kind of effect, it becomes really important to be able to see, well, this component only takes these events, so I'm going to need to figure out how to create those events and stream them in. It kind of dials everything back to the usual functioning, functional programming paradigm of I'm only making decisions on my inputs. Uh, it's just that we're wrapping this up into a stream where multiple values can flow through them and we compose these streams together. Are there any questions with that? Um, it's a bit gnarly, it's a bit small, so I can talk about it some more if there are any questions from there. Uh, and if it's kind of reasonably sunk in, all this code will be up, so you can have a play with it and click all the buttons. Uh, it will look precisely uh, like this guy. Mm. Scrolling, scrolling. And this is all the usual stuff here. This is not going to work. I shouldn't have let it go. Oh, cool. It actually worked. Cool. Um, <laughs> uh, but you'll be, able to, you'll be able to go and play with that, change the code, do whatever you want, see the compiler as find out how hideous those compiler is and how much of a, an art form it is to uh, understand them. Uh, cool. Yes? Okay, is it just as easy to extend, to insert like S4, button signal, yeah, whatever, that thing, and just put a handle button at the bottom, and that's all you need to do to, to add like a fourth button? Uh, yeah, yeah, you would just need to create a new button signal there and then yeah, the add it to the merge menu. Uh, you, and you could write fancy your combinators for this kind of stuff as well. Uh, I just tried to keep it fairly simple. Um, don't worry about that from just, it's bad, but it's not bad because it'll never crash. Really needs a non-empty list. Yeah, they don't have a non-empty list. Anyhow. Uh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so I... This is probably a really bad slide because nobody's going to remember the details of the previous time where I showed you what the editor interface looked like. But the, the place that I ended up with were, was my editor environment now is just a set of signals. Rather than passing in callbacks and then having those callbacks have to join up with this web of effects, these things now just show a clear stream of things that can happen in the editor that someone might care about. And now I don't have to change the editor for possible callbacks that need to be woven in. It just puts out all the things that someone could care about and they can choose to deal with that or they, choose, they can choose not to. Uh, which is really cool because it turns that problem on its head. Rather than having to, to feed callbacks in, you just say, you can subscribe to this if you want. Uh, and it will just flow away. Uh, <laughs> Is there anything else? No. Cool. Um, so that flipped its on its head, and at that point, everything was just, every component that I was building was just this nice. It took in signals, and it either gave out it gave out a signal of either a new event value that something else needed to care about, or it passed out an effect that eventually had to get woven in. But at that point, the, the effects that you had to kind of gel together at the end were much smaller. Instead of the web of effects being around the entire program, it was only the bits that actually needed to change the DOM that were actually, uh, like actually wrapped up with effects at that point. So it just cleaned everything up, and I didn't have to worry so much about, oh, I need to add another extensible effect down here and spend 20 minutes uh, upgrading all my uh, type signatures to include the new 
to include the new effect. Cool. I'll just get through some final points. Uh, I, that's, that's the main thing that I wanted to talk about. Hey, PureScript's neat, FRP is even neater. Um, but just the, the pure, the, the kind of story of writing to the DOM at the end of Signals is not great. It's not meant for that. Signals is a pure FRP library. Uh, so if you want to get into that, you should look at things like Pux or Halogen. Uh, Pux is a, uses the same signal libraries over the top of React components. So you have React components that have signals flowing in and signals flowing out, which is really neat, and it means you could probably leverage a lot of the React ecosystem instead of writing all the stuff yourself. Uh, or Halogen, which is much more of a pure, pure script version where they've even written their own FRP system, which is a, it's an upgrade from raw signals because not a, it's not just a push-based system. There is actually a concept of having a signal that is a constant value that can be sampled at any point in time by another signal pulling from it, which is really helpful sometimes because like modeling the dirty, the is dirty of an editor is actually really tricky because you don't really want it to fire every time that happens. Uh, you kind of just want it to fire when something needs to check it. Uh, so being able to have that inversion of just a, a value that you poll when you need to is a really awesome thing to have in the FRP library. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'm not going to show any code. But both of these libraries, obviously Pux, React, so it's virtual DOM, and Halogen uses the PureScript virtual DOM, just without React. Uh, and they're both very cool and worth checking out. Cool. Mm. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, some quick, I talked a lot about what changed, but some quick points here. Payload. Payload is something that people kind of worry about. The entire payload with all the FRP dependencies came to about 357k unminified and unzipped, which is within the realms of being nice. Uh, <laughs> certainly when you build a big library around this, the code base wasn't tremendously huge. It was maybe 5,000 lines of pure script. Uh, but if you were going to write a text editor in there, it might, it's probably going to be bigger than the JavaScript. Uh, so it depends on what you're writing. It could be okay, it might not be. The fact that that's unminified should mean that that can get down a lot better. But for some reason, Uglify made my JavaScript crash when I I made it. I, I took the white space out of it to get down to that 357, but when it was actually changing variable names, it messed it up. Really wish we weren't writing strings. It'd be great. Uh, cool, cool. Uh, and other crap that was in there, I had jQuery and moment.js time zone, which has a crap load of information in there. But that's okay. If you're going to bring in those libraries, you, there's no way to avoid the, the size bump there. Cool. Some warnings. I talked about strict evaluation. If you're a Haskell programmer, you probably need to think about what you're doing in PureScript a bit more than you otherwise would in Haskell. A example of that is alternative. Uh, if you have like a very expensive computation here, alternative to this very expensive computation here, both of those will happen before the alternative gets at the value. Uh, so it's definitely not as nice from that point of view, but I don't know if I'd give all that up for choosing something that was so far away from JavaScript that jumping that fence between JavaScript and PureScript was like orders of magnitude harder. Uh, and the FFI was a real pain in the butt. Being so close to JavaScript does have its merits. So I think this is probably worth it. It just, can't, it just limits your ability to write abstractions that you're used to in Haskell learned. Uh, the language is pretty badly in flux. I wrote code for my proof of concept on 0 0.8.0, uh, what was it, two months ago, and now it doesn't compile. Uh, due to, yeah, due to an external module, not even my own code. Uh, so it's changing a lot, and they don't really care about breaking stuff. Which is cool if you want the language to evolve, but you have, to, you have to kind of wear the uh, maintenance burden of having to keep up with that. So if you're talking about something, if you're talking about a project where 
you can't handle that kind of maintenance burden or it's got to last 10 years and maybe PureScript might not even be around then, you have to be careful with this kind of thing. Uh, but you have those decisions anyway with any library that you pick. Uh, and with the language so much in flux and with so many hobbyists coming in, I know Sean and I have kind of written libraries and then let them to bit rot. But you have to, there's, there are, like, yeah, there are, there are libraries that are more maintained than others, and the libraries that look, you have to really pick and choose your libraries to make sure that you're not using one that is fairly unloved. Because it probably only has one or two maintainers, so you have to be making sure that they're still in the pure script world. Um, the easiest way is pick anything by slam data because they are going balls to the wall with PureScript with their analytics software. So if, they, if they're writing it, then you know it's going to work for a long time and it's going to be kept up to date. Uh, oh yeah, and with all the latest libraries and the current PureScript compilers, uh, with a fresh compile, you get 500 compiler warnings. <laughs> um, but that's cool. It means they're fixing stuff. Um, deprecation warnings are better than at breaking. Uh, and as I said, the community is small, it's even smaller than Haskell, so if you're going to pick up a library, you kind of have to say, am I able to maintain this library? And I think if you're going to be realistic, you probably also have to consider the compiler in exactly the same fashion. So you have to be brave uh, to pick this up, but I personally think it's worth it, but I'm not going to go, I'm not on the text editor team, so they, they might not be as brave as I am. Uh, with a proof of concept, it's fine. I can be as brave as I want, it doesn't matter if I mess up. Uh, but be careful. Uh, I certainly am saying it's cool, but be very careful. It's not something that's production ready and you should go balls to the wall without considering the, the alternatives. But the alternative is JavaScript, right? It has to be better than that. <laughs> uh, and as I said, the minification broke my code. I don't know why that was. Uh, but it's text. It's weird. Uh, cool. Some quick references before I finish up. Uh, you might want to read the Pure Script by Example book. It's got a really, it's a really good step by step into all the concepts that are sitting around Pure Script, including all the monads and the applicatives. It's kind of like the Learn Your Haskell of the Pure Script world. You might have to fight with whether the, you might have to fight with an older version of the compiler to keep up with the book. Uh, so if you ever if you pick up the book and have any problems, let me know because I'll be able to say you need to downgrade your compiler to this because the book hasn't been upgraded yet. Books are harder to keep in sync than code is. Uh, you definitely want to look at pursuit.pureScript.org. It's where all the documentation is, so you'll be able to search for any module and find all its documentation. It's a much better story than when it was all scattered around GitHub uh, in Markdown pages. Uh, and these are all clickable. These are just links to Pursuit. Uh, check out the Signal Docs. It's a pretty cool library uh, by Bodle. Uh, and the the uh, the influence to that library is actually Elm. Uh, but if you like Haskell and you like maths, I probably wouldn't go down that route. I much prefer PureScript and not enjoying languages that people seem to ignore theory and say that's too hard and they're scary words. So let's not use it and use something completely meaningless as well. Um, signals are cool, halogen is really cool. It's probably the closest thing you're gonna to find to being an entire framework for writing a single page app uh, in PureScript with FRP. So it's definitely worth a look. And Pux is also interesting if you're in the React space uh, because just the ability to wire up React components with Signal sounds really cool. Uh, and that is the end. I think I've talked for enough. It's almost been an hour. Uh, are there any questions? The way, the way you phrased the, the editor interface, like, it didn't, you kind of said it turns it around, but if you look at it, you are, the editor either emits events you can listen to or exposes channels you can subscribe to. It's kind of yes. the same, it just it is, it type, is, it is type it is, system it helps you. Like. It, is, it is exactly the same except the signal, the dealing with the signals is pure, whereas putting in your callback and weaving all that together in your effect 
is not. But, no, that's zero. Yeah, uh, that's that's what I was meaning. It's exactly the same paradigm. You just kind of things are coming out rather than well, the signal's coming out, and you're doing you're dealing with that in a p completely pure environment rather than having everything being this mess of effects. Because that's the thing that was really hard to deal with. I had some very gnarly times where my proof of concept didn't compile for about an hour with me just having to twiddle types all the way up the tree. And you don't want that. Like having that web of effects everywhere is just disgusting. The less JavaScript guy will, guys will just tell you but why are you doing it in the first place. You can just use JavaScript and don't worry about anything. Yeah, but it, it just breaks all the time. <laughs> And I'd much rather get to the point where I don't have that web of effects, but I still have the nice componentry of this is exactly my component, these are the inputs that it takes, and dealing with that in a pure way. And having, some, having a very small kernel at the end wire all those effects together. That is the coolest part about signals. Just minimizing that. Are there any testing tools for pure script? Like HUNS? Kind of yeah, there, there's a... There's a Quick check equivalent. There's there's testing. Yeah. Oh, speaking of tests, uh, be careful with the pure script pro functor lenses library. Uh, it pretty much has no tests, including just uh, trying to compile basic use cases, which I found out the hard way when stuff didn't compile, and I was wondering whether I was just stupid or not. Uh, yeah, be careful with some libraries because there's they're a bit more flimsy than they probably should be. Is there an easy way to check which libraries do you compile, like like Stackage or something like that? For uh, no, yeah. they've only just got a central repository for all their docs, let alone something like that. Fair enough. Uh, but a lot of the things, a lot of the modules don't like. They just kind of upgrade to the bleeding edge, so you kind of have to keep going with it. Yeah. Uh, they, it's not as strict as Haskell land from the looks of it, where people will support three versions at a time. It looks like they support two versions, and that's where you get the five from the board when you're trying to compile stuff. Cool. Yeah, but is the workflow like the compile this compiler take a long time? Is it all live reload? And uh, yeah, I, I, if you look at my server, the live reloads pretty quick. So it, my server, it, oh, I may not have filled out the readme, but I'll do it when I get home tonight. You can just boot it up with npm run server, hit it in the browser, you make a change, and it's recompiled really quickly. Enough that I can change it and then look straight at the console. I don't have a sip of coffee waiting for it or anything like that. Um, the full build where you're doing minification and uglification and bringing everything into one file takes longer, but with the development server, it's quick. Cool. Pizza's here. Sweet. Uh, well, pizza's here. Do you want to get up and talk, or do you want to do that after pizza? Or no, I'll do the floor hands if you All right, awesome. Okay. Here's the floor. Uh, camera. camera on, camera on. Uh, camera on, keep it on. All right, cool. Okay, cool. Um, my name's Chris, the most of you know me. I work now at a company called Dose Me. And we pay for the pizza, so you get a very short marketing spiel from me. <laughs> um, generally, doctors aren't really very excellent at figuring out how much to give you of a drug. They get the doses wrong a bit. We write some software that uses a whole ton of math to help doctors get very, help doctors give very accurate and correct doses for drugs. And we're doing this for blood thinners, we're doing it for antibiotics, we're doing this for autoimmunity suppressants, and we're doing this for chemotherapy drugs and any other drug that people are willing to talk to us about. And typically with these kinds of drugs, when you get the dose wrong, one of the typical outcomes amongst all the other adverse outcomes is death. <laughs> so we're writing software which is literally saving lives and stopping people from dying, forgetting all the fact that it improves people's quality, people's quality of life gets them out of hospital faster, and just makes them healthier more often. Um, we're hiring, and we're over at, we've got an office over at Turinga. If we sound interesting to you, then come have a chat to myself, or have a chat to Rob, who's going to wave at you all. Um, <laughs> he knows far more about the math and the medical side. I just do all the software. Um, currently we're hiring a QA engineer, we're also looking for a developer who has a background in pharmacometrics or bioinformatics. 
and in the coming months we'll be hiring more general developers. So please come and talk to us. We'd love to have some interest. Thank you. Cool. Just quickly and on that, we want, um, oh, it's a bit cliche, we want clever people and in terms of if you don't quite match up for the role, come and talk to us anyway um, and we'll see what we can do. We'd rather, we'd, we can balance, we're a small startup so we can balance some responsibilities uh, around if we have um, really good people in, in the team. So. Otherwise, go and enjoy pizza while it's still warm. Thanks, Chris. Yes. And thanks, Toasty, for the pizza. Thanks, Toasty. <laughs>